Jim was his name. I knew him from the UU church I had joined earlier that year. He was a real Chicagoan, born and raised, spoke with a dialect. Could have been a person in that Da Bear skit that used to run on Saturday Night Live. Kind of disheveled in his appearance, usually in need of a shave. At least 20 years older than me. The kind of person I probably wouldn't know at all if I hadn't met him at church. He was sitting in the small Chicago apartment that I shared with Susan, the apartment where we would live while I studied to become a UU minister, the apartment where we would live until the day we moved to Des Moines for me to begin serving this church in 2001. <coughs> Jim was paying me a visit as part of the pledge drive at church that year. The congregation was doing a one-to-one -one canvas, members talking to members about church, but more specifically about financial commitment to the church. He brought with him a pledge form so that I could write down the dollar amount of what I planned to give in the coming year. I'd heard a few testimonials during services, seen some handouts about that year's pledge drive, but, you know, I didn't really pay much attention. I knew my resources were tight, and they would be for many years. After all, I was going into the ministry. <laughs> <laughs> my financial future was uncertain at best. Jim and I sat at the kitchen table and we made small talk for a while, and then he slid the form my way, asked me to submit my pledge. I wrote down a number, a small number, I think it was about $150, for the entire year. 52 weeks of service and programs, 52 weeks of operating a building that served not just the members of the church, but the neighborhood as well, support groups, theater troops, community meetings. I knew my pledge was small, but I figured Jim and the church would understand. It was the church, after all, the home of compassion and forgiveness. I handed him the form. He looked at it, paused for a moment, and then leaned in toward me as if he had a secret to share. He softened his voice. He said, you know, Mark, back when I was new to the church, trying to figure out how much I should give. I figured I could give to the church at least as much as I spent on beer. <laughs> and then he handed the form back to me. He asked me to reconsider my play. So what do you think I did? I raised my pledge. I more than doubled it, in fact. Eh, not that big of a deal, right? But it was. I'm not sure how much I was spending on beer at the time. <laughs> That's not really the point he was making. He was asking me to put the church ahead of some of my less significant priorities. To think of my giving to the church not just as a token offering, or as a fulfillment of some minimum obligation, but as a commitment, as an expression of devotion for what the church already was in my life, and what it could become. Did I resent him for asking me to give more? Of course not. I thanked him for his time. I thanked him for caring enough about our church to nudge me to consider how much I care. I thanked him for suggesting, in his way, that I offer a pledge that was more of a stretch for me, and therefore a fit. Now, I was new to being a member of a church as an adult. I didn't know much about pledging or what it takes to run a church. I had no idea how much some people give. I had no idea that some people give as much as 5 or 7 or even 10% of their annual income to the church. And that the rest of us, well, we get to live off their generosity. I didn't learn that until I was a minister. But it's the truth. And I'm thinking it would surprise many of you if you saw how generous some people are to this place. This place where we all get to participate 52 weeks a year, no matter what we give. Maybe to see the generosity of others would inspire you. It has inspired me, that's for sure. In the first few years of my ministry, I thought I shouldn't know how much people pledge. Some of my fellow seminary students and even a few of my professors had suggested that if a minister knows how much individuals pledge, then that minister may treat those individuals differently. Well, I didn't want to do that. We're all equal no matter what we give, right? Inherent worth and dignity and all that. 
so I refused to look. During these years, Susan and I did grow our giving to the church, but as a percentage of our income, not really all that much more than what we had been giving to that Chicago congregation. I remember asking the church treasurer here at the time what the median pledge was, you know, kind of like the middle ground. I figured that would be a good pledge for the minister. I think it was around $1,000 at the time, for the entire year, 52 weeks, 52 weeks of services, and meaningful connections, and coffee hours, and meeting people I'd probably not otherwise meet, 52 weeks of social justice agitation and religious education for adults and children, 52 weeks of learning to love more people more of the time. Over the next pledge drive, Susan and I raised our giving each year, but not very much, really. There was no science in our decisions, not much passion either, to tell you the truth. Our increases were mostly arbitrary. Susan let me decide. I knew we needed to increase if we could, so we did. A few hundred dollars more one year, a few hundred dollars more the next. As our pledge amount started to rise, I thought we were giving a lot, certainly our fair share, and by some standards, we were. We had moved beyond the median pledge by at least $1,000 by then. We were giving enough, so when we occasionally got behind in our monthly payments, I would end up having to write really big checks that depleted our meager bank account. Sometimes after writing these checks, I even resented the church. Did we have to give so much? It's like I was paying my own salary. Once we switched to automatic payments, having our monthly pledge deducted directly from our checking account, we no longer fell behind, and I no longer had reason to resent the church. <laughs> For a minister, that's a good thing. <laughs> Meanwhile, the congregation was growing. Lots of new members were joining. We added staff. The budget kept growing, too, mostly because people, more people were pledging. As Nikki told you, we had a capital campaign raised about one and a half million dollars. Susan and I gave four thousand dollars to the campaign over three years. Four thousand total. I could do the math. Some people were giving a lot more than we were. That's for sure. I was grateful they had it to give. It was easy to see the impact of their generosity. Our building was transformed into a very different and more welcoming place. Those of you who remember how it was before can testify to that. More light, more gathering and office space, more energy efficiency, more room to bloom, as we said. And bloom we have. Today we have double the members we had when I started in 2001, and nearly four times the children and youth enrolled in our RE programs. That's blooming. On my sabbatical in 2008, I visited vibrant, growing UU congregations around the country. I learned what it might take for us to continue growing into the church that I knew in my heart we could be. And I came back to the church convinced that we needed a redesign of how we approached our staffing, including the creation of some new positions. I gathered with some church leaders to put together a plan. We talked about all the jobs we thought would be best handled by professional staff, and we created positions on big flip chart paper pages of you know, who might handle these tasks. I went home and looked over all the plans that we'd made, and I crunched the numbers. And I realized that we needed more than a 20% increase in our pledges to pay for all these new positions. 20% across the board. And i got to tell you, I got cold feet. I got scared. I told the group at our next meeting that I was having doubts. I think they were surprised to hear that. They're used to me being so, you know, optimistic. And I'll never forget what they said to me. In fact, I think what they said that night changed my ministry in ways I'm still discovering. One of them said, Mark, tell us what we need. We'll find the money. I looked around the room, and everyone was nodding their head in agreement. At the very moment when I was tempted to play small, to give in to a scarcity mentality, committed, generous members of this church said, Mark, go big, that we have abundance to share. The confidence that small group showed in what was possible was inspiring to me. If they could commit to finding the money that we needed, so could I. That year I took a bigger interest in the pledge drive. I looked at what people gave. I looked at what people gave. And you know what? 
I did start treating members differently. I found that I was a lot more grateful to a lot more people more of the time. And I had reason to think about my own pledge differently. I realized that Susan and I had a responsibility to become visionary in our approach, approach to pledging, to see to the future rather than just sustain the present. So that year we increased our pledge by more than 25%. Our increases have continued ever since as we continue to move toward the place on that fair share giving guide where we truly belong. Now Susan and I are visionaries. <laughs> or visionaries, <laughs> on our way to a full 10% tie. The pledge form I turned in last night that communicated what we were promising to this church in the coming year totaled $5,000 for the year. We're going to start our pledge in March. For us, the 52 weeks of ministry we provide in this church deserves nothing less. Now I've come to see, for us, this is our fair share. This is a more true expression of our devotion to this congregation, the people in it, the people yet to come, as well as those who will never even enter our doors, but who will be impacted by the presence of a vibrant, forward-thinking, justice-seeking UU Church in Des Moines nonetheless. Now you may be thinking, duh, Mark should give that much. He is the minister. But I hope you have figured out from what I've already shared that giving this much did not come easily for a guy like me. A guy who not so long ago would have said the only way you can get me to church every week is to pay me to be there. <laughs> what did it take for Susan and, and me to increase our pledge to where I think it should be now? Well, it took time for us to learn. It took paying attention to how much this church really offers our family and the community. It took taking an honest look at ourselves and what we most wanted for this congregation and our lives in it. Another story. When I was in the search process that landed me here in Des Moines to serve this church, I interviewed with several congregations around the country. At one of these interviews, a member of the search committee at a Midwestern church asked me the following question. Considering most UUs don't believe in hell, how will you convince us that we should give more to the church? <laughs> At the time, mostly ignorant of the ins and outs of pledging and church budgets, I laughed off this question. It actually, it kind of annoyed me, but I, I, I mostly laughed it off. And I talked about how, well, you know, I would encourage people to not give until it hurts, but give until it feels good. These many years later, now that I have a broader vision of what is possible for Unitarian Universalism, especially here in Des Moines, I think I would say a lot more to that fellow. These days, I think I would say, you know what, I don't believe in hell either. Not a hell that exists after we have died. A hell that exists as a punishment for what we have or have not done in this life. But I do believe in a kind of hell that is created in the here and now when we won't bring ourselves to embrace the possible when we keep ourselves in a constant state of scarcity, when we yearn for lives of doing more and being more and serving more, but we always hold back. We always have one foot out the door. How we give or don't give to the church can be just another expression of that kind of hell. When our giving to the church is not a reflection of the value that it brings to our lives or an expression of the value we want it to bring to our community, then we are, in a sense, telling ourselves our own dreams, our own yearnings, are not worthy of our devotion. We create a self-fulfilling prophecy of defeat. See, I think church exists to bring us back to what is really important in our lives and in the common life that we share. I think church exists to bring us out of the hell of isolation, of scarcity, of fear, and into the heaven of a life of connection, generosity, and love. My job is to remind people why we are here, what we can do and become together, and why it matters that we try. And I can only do that job effectively when I am reminding everybody that this job belongs to every one of us. 
I'm still learning how important this job is, how much we all need to do it. You see, now that I know how people pledge here, I believe I have some proof in my belief that a hell exists from half-hearted participation, from holding back. I've come to see that the biggest givers to this church, both in percentage of income, not total, but in percentage of income and in time shared, the biggest givers are not the ones who end up complaining the most, who sit in judgment of all the church doesn't do well. In fact, the more people give to the church in money and time, it seems to me, the less dissatisfied they typically are. How could this be? How could it be that those with the greatest investment of their resources are the least likely to complain and the most likely to be happy here? Maybe it's because these folks no longer see the church as a they. They see the church as a we. And that we always includes them. And if something is not right, they have a role to play in making it better. We're doing very well as a congregation in many ways. I look at our church these days, I see a healthy, vibrant place served by an amazing staff of committed, dedicated, creative, talented people who are fairly compensated but who are worth more than we could ever pay them. Can I get an amen? Hey, hey, amen. amen. Tracy, Lori, Deb, Moira, Natalie, Jane, Sarah, Sydney, Connie, Bruce, Amy, Heather, and all of our child care staff. I see a congregation that is eager to welcome new people, that's yearning to affect positive change in the community, wants to expand its own sense of ministry in the midst of this complicated life we share. But I also see a congregation that deserves to be more than we are. I see a congregation that is no longer adequately staffed to meet our current needs or those we will have as we continue to grow. I see a congregation that deserves someone on staff besides Lori or lay volunteers to oversee our revamped pastoral care ministry, for example. I see a congregation that would benefit from more staff hours in our children and youth programs. And I see a congregation that deserves another minister to share the public and pastoral work that I cannot adequately handle on my own. Amen. Another minister Amen. to stand Amen. 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 Another minister, for example, who could engage in our social justice efforts, right? Who could help us create and sustain more opportunities for witness and service in the community by supporting and organizing and empowering us to invest ourselves more fully in the values of justice, equality, and human worth and dignity that brought us here in the first place. Another minister who could be a pastoral presence for us in difficult times, who could officiate weddings and memorial services. Another minister who could speak from this pulpit and in the community, giving voice to our UU values. Another minister who is someone other than a white, middle-aged male. Amen. <laughs> who might speak in different ways to our increasingly diverse congregation. I believe we should begin the work to hire another minister this spring, right away, with the goal of having someone on staff no later than the fall of 2014. To do this, we need to increase our pledging to the church. We need more people to become more visionary in their giving. We need more people to see the potential of our congregation and to make their investment in our future today. As you know, following the service, you're asked to submit your pledge for the coming fiscal year. There are people waiting for your pledge in the gathering area. If you didn't bring your pledge form, please get a form from one of the volunteers. If you've never pledged before, blank forms are available for you as well. Look at that fair share giving guide. <clears throat> Determine where your family's pledge should be. Consider stretching into a new category. Even if you can't get to that level this year, it took Susan and me a few years to get where we are today. Make a commitment today to begin moving toward that amount in the years to come. Know that every dollar matters and will be gratefully received. But before you pledge, I want you to think about all that we currently do here that provides value and meaning to our lives. I want you to think of the services that stir your heart, that call you to action, that remind you of all that you are and all that you still have to give to this life that we share. 
I want you to think about how the presence of a vibrant UU church in Des Moines makes a difference for those who want to be part of a religion that leaves room for atheists and agnostics, for Wiccans, for free thinkers who yearn for community. I want you to think of the meaningful connections you can make here through Soul Matters groups and small group ministry, Generation UU, and the many groups and classes that we offer, including our growing music ministry. How would your lives be different without these opportunities to ponder life, to share, to play, to be heard? Think of the ways this congregation has stood for justice and a community that works better for all people. Think of our commitment to Amos, the efforts of our various social justice groups, our public witness for marriage equality and LGBT rights. Think of how much value and meaning we bring to our young people through our religious education programming and our nurturing of their self-worth through classes like Coming of Age and the Our Whole Lives Sexuality Curriculum. Think of the importance of this multi-generational community of discovery, learning, and service in all of our lives. Is there anywhere else where we have more opportunity to interact and learn from people of all ages we might not otherwise meet? Think of all those who have contributed in the past to make today possible. How does our giving now honor their generosity then? Think of all these things. I trust that if you do, you will see a congregation worthy of your most generous contribution. A congregation worthy of your devotion. May it be so. Our lives together deserve nothing less.